Welcome back to our study of the story of the Bible. We've already discussed Act 1, the story of creation. Act 2, the story of the fall. Act 3, the story of Israel. And in our last lesson, Act 4, the story of Jesus. Now we enter into Act 5, the story of the church. And again, to emphasize the continuity of this story, I'd like to take a moment to go back to Genesis 12 and verse 3 where God made that grand promise to Abram that through his seed, all the families of the earth would be blessed. I emphasize the word seed and the word blessed because God made this promise to Abram. It was passed down in Genesis 26 to his son Isaac, but Isaac was not that seed. It was passed down again to his son Jacob in Genesis 28, but Jacob was not the fulfillment of that promise either. We find in Galatians 3 and verse 16 that Paul tells us Jesus Christ was that seed. It would be through Jesus that all the families of the earth would be blessed. As Paul breaks down that verse, Genesis 12, 3, he says that God made a promise to a seed, singular, not seeds as of many, but unto your seed, who is Christ. Well, how would Jesus Christ bless all the families of the earth? Peter, in his second sermon, in Acts 3 and verse 26, tells us that God raised up his son Jesus and sent him to bless us by turning all of us away from our iniquities, our sins. We might say the forgiveness of our sins. As Peter in that first sermon said in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission, the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off. We might say to all the families of the earth that God would bless all families, all nations, through Jesus by the forgiveness of our sins. Now we are in Acts 2, the beginning of the church. And the story of the church is a very important part of the story as a whole. And we're going to emphasize two main reasons that is the case. Number one, the church is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies regarding the reign of God. And number two, the church is the modern day temple. That is the dwelling place of God. Well, let's start with the first one, that the church is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies regarding the reign of God. Isaiah, in Isaiah 2, tells us that it should come to pass. He looks down at a future time and says, It will come to pass that God will establish the house of the Lord and all nations will flow into it. Joel chapter 2 says that there would come a time when God would pour out his spirit on all peoples and that all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We find in uh, the second chapter of the book of Daniel, you'll notice Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, Joel 2. In Daniel 2, we find that there's a kingdom coming that should never be destroyed, a kingdom that would never be left to another people, a kingdom that would be forever. Well, Peter, here in Acts 2, looks back at prophets like Isaiah and Joel and says these, these things are coming to pass now. These things are fulfilled now in the establishment of the church. And so the church is the place where God was bringing his kingdom about, where he was setting up his house. And all of this because of Jesus and what Jesus did for the world on that cross by bringing the forgiveness of sins. That Jesus purchased the church with his own blood, Acts 20 and verse 28. The second reason is that the church is the modern day temple, the dwelling place of God. And think about it for a moment. If you go back to the story of the Bible and you think about Exodus 40, when the tabernacle was made, that dwelling place of God made of cloth and of posts, Moses put that together, and in Exodus 40, we find a dark cloud descending 
upon that tabernacle. The Bible says that the glory of the Lord filled that tabernacle. If you fast forward 500 years to David's son Solomon, in 1 Kings chapter 8, we have the dedication of the temple, now built with brick and mortar. And a dark cloud descends upon that tabernacle. Remember the glory of the Lord also filled that place. Well, now here we are with the church. And the Bible tells us that the church is a building as well. It's not made of cloth or posts. It's not made of brick or mortar. 1 Peter 2 tells us that it is made of living stones built up to a spiritual house, a holy priesthood offering acceptable sacrifices to God. Paul tells the church at Corinth, do you not know that your body is a temple? That God's spirit dwells in you? It makes sense that if God is dwelling in the tabernacle, if God is dwelling in the temple, and now the church is described as a temple, the Christian body is described as a temple, that this is the place where God is once again among his people, reestablishing his reign through Jesus and ruling and reigning among his people. So God, in bringing about the church, brings a very important piece to this story as God is now again reigning through Jesus, who is the head of the body, the head of the church, Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23. And now, as the church is also pictured as a temple, he is among his people. One other thing about the idea of the church and the temple and God dwelling there is a reference that John makes in John chapter 1 to Jesus himself. That Jesus came in the flesh and dwelt among us. Literally, that word dwelt means he tabernacled among us. He pitched his tent among us, if you will. And God says, or John there says, that we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. We beheld the glory of God, the kind of glory that only belongs to God, and we beheld it in the person of Jesus as Jesus came in the outer tent, so to speak, of man. Act 5 is the story of the church. God has reestablished his reign through his king, Jesus Christ. And God is once again dwelling among his people in the church. See you next time.